<laughs> Understanding hi-fi products can be confusing, even for me, and I've been at this for 20 plus years. Take Cambridge Audio's brand new CXN 100 network player. I mean, is it a music streamer? Is it a DAC? Is it a all digital preamp? Or is it actually all of those things rolled into one? Let's start with the basics. The CXN100 replaces the now four-year-old CXN V2 that we reviewed back in 2020. Its replacement, the CXN100, gets an upgrade with ESS Sabre DAX, whereas the V2 had Wolfson chips. This upgrade gives you support for files and formats like DSD-512, as well as PCM up to 32768, not to mention integrated Bluetooth and MQA support, something that you did not get with the older V2. It also uses the latest version of Stream Magic, which is Cambridge Audio's streaming and control app. There are a few changes to the 100's back panel layout, but most of the connection options from the outgoing V2 remain the same. For physical inputs, you get USB, Ethernet, coaxial, and optical options. For the output, Puts, there are coaxial and optical connections, as well as balanced and unbalanced analog audio outputs. Wireless connectivity is also improved with support for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.1, AirPlay 2, and Chromecast. The 100 supports popular streaming services, such as Spotify and Tidal Connect, which again includes MQA support, not to mention Cobuzz and Deezer. And for you Rune users, the 100 is also Rune ready. Going back to the 100's many hats, the Cambridge can be set up to be just a streamer, just a DAC, a DAC streamer, as well as an all digital preamp with a DAC and a streamer. Having so much flexibility was something that I was really excited about. Regardless of how you choose to set up the Cambridge, there is one thing that you're going to need. You need to download the Stream Magic app to get the 100 up and running. Now, we tested the Cambridge in a variety of ways and we connected it to just a slew of gear. When using the 100 as a streamer, we connected it to our Yamaha 1000A using an optical connection as well as an analog one. This let us compare the Cambridge's new DACs to the Yamaha's internal DACs, which also use ESS Sabre DACs, albeit not the same ones. We also tested the 100 with our Apple TV 4K connected via HDMI to our 98 inch TCL TV. Now this gave us a different look at the 100's DAC, this time by directing the sound to the Cambridge using an optical cable from the TV's optical audio out, as well as via AirPlay from the Apple TV. To use the 100 as a preamp, we turned on its volume function and connected its analog audio outputs to the Primair A35.2, creating a digital-only separate system. For wireless streaming and control, I relied on my iPhone 14, MacBook Pro, and Air laptops, as well as our Google Home devices. In order to limit the number of variables, I decided to stick with a single pair of speakers for the majority of our tests. So if you've been taking notes, go ahead and mark down Focal's new Aria Evo X towers running full range for sound. All right, so starting off with the Cambridge as a streamer and a DAC, I highly recommend that you always use its analog outputs. Now, there was a slight difference in volume between the two output options, which may give some folks the impression that one is gonna be better than the other, but when I level matched using an SPL meter, I wasn't sold on any real performance gains between the XLR or the RCA out, so use whichever one's gonna work best for you. The improvements, however, that you get when relying on the 100's internal DACs rather than bypassing them are 100% worth it. The 100 sound is as advertised when using its internal digital to analog conversion. It's weighty, textural, and dare I say, analog-like, at least when compared to streamers from say Ever Solo and Wim. If you bypass the 100's DAC, I doubt you'll find the sound to be much, if any, different from any other streamer that relies on a separate third-party DAC. I know I didn't. So if you're going to invest in the 100, use its DAC. Those of you who think that digital music sounds clinical or lifeless should respond well to the 100 sound. Now, I'm not gonna repeat Cambridge's marketing brief and say that this is gonna turn MQA into vinyl. It's not warm or analog like that. But it's also not etched or hyper detailed either. Now, you could argue that this means that the 100 is colored in some way, and I might even agree with some of you. Some of my favorite test tracks, like Moby's Everloving, sounded fuller and weightier, but they also sounded more laid back and softer at the extremes. And I can't say if this voicing is going to be for everyone, but I will say this much. Lesser quality recordings were definitely better through the Cambridge, and I was able to listen to all genres of music for longer periods of time without fatigue, or worse, without having my attention pulled away from the music and to the gear itself, which is just always a really good thing. 
Switching gears, let's talk about using the Cambridge as an all digital preamp in DAC. First off, I think it's great that they give you the option to use the 100 as a very basic preamp with a variable volume control, but considering the $1,100 price tag, I think Cambridge has left some opportunities to be more competitive on the table. And speaking of being competitive, according to Cambridge, the CXN is a very cost sensitive product and was designed as a high quality source rather than a fully featured preamp. That's the response I got when I asked Cambridge about some of the choices surrounding the preamp functionality or lack thereof. To be clear, the older CXN V2 had the same preamp functionality as the 100, and that was four years ago. I was pretty smitten by it then, but today's market is vastly different than it was in 2020. While I'm all for the idea of creating a quote, cost sensitive product by leaving off things like tone controls, balance, better input selection, or even higher end features like EQ, if you're gonna do that, why add preamp functionality at all? Had Cambridge just built a sound first streamer that looked like the 100, I'm talking a full width component with a color screen and just went ahead and removed higher functionality like variable volume and some modest preamp like functions, they still would have totally hit their cost sensitive goals. Not to mention they could have avoided the inevitable comparisons to lower cost darlings like Wim and Eversolo, which offer similar products, but with more features. When I asked Cambridge if they could add, say, some of these other features via firmware update, they said yes, any feature that benefits the user experience is under consideration, but they would not comment to me on the timeline for when users could expect any new features that may benefit them. The omission of HDMI here is perhaps the biggest miss. Including HDMI would have been among the easier things to implement, not to mention it would have immediately differentiated the 100 from the outgoing CXN V2. Now, Cambridge claims their customers didn't want HDMI and that foregoing its adoption kept costs down. <laughs> okay. The inclusion of HDMI with CEC would have given users the option for some modest remote functionality without having to rely on their phone all of the time or be forced to purchase a compatible Cambridge remote separately since the 100 does not come with its own standalone remote in the box. Now, if you own a Cambridge CX a series amp, your remote will control the 100. But if you're rocking an AXA or AXR series product, a remote's gonna run you another 15 bucks. Not a huge cost, but still, it's potentially annoying. Now, if you're okay with using your phone all of the time, the Cambridge app is pretty great, and in my experience, rock solid reliable. I'm not gonna go so far as to say it's a entirely different user experience than what you're gonna find with WIM or any four stream enabled device like our Pantheon smart speaker. For the novice user, it is going to be a little easier to use than say a WIM or EverSolo app, but that's only because it feels like the Costco version of those apps. And for a streamer that comes with a higher price tag, I actually found it to be a little bit basic. Now the 100's Bluetooth and AirPlay functionality is really good, which is gonna come in handy since the Cambridge lacks native support for services like Apple Music and Amazon. Thankfully, the resulting sound is fantastic, but again, I have to point out that these services are supported by the competition. One quick note about AirPlay, we discovered a bug while using AirPlay with the Cambridge and an Apple TV 4K. AirPlay and Google apps such as YouTube TV, YouTube, or YouTube Music resulted in a distorted sound. Think something like sound being played back underwater. Now we notified Cambridge and they have confirmed our findings as well as letting us know we're the first one to mention it and they are working on a fix. They are still trying to understand though if the fault is with the product or if it's actually on Apple's end. Y'all ready for the comparisons? I already mentioned both Wim and Eversolo as being the proverbial competitive thorns in Cambridge's side, but setting aside the more affordable pricing of the Wim Pro and Eversolo DMP A6 and focusing solely on sound, the Cambridge will give those of you who like a more analog-like sound exactly what you're after. I wouldn't even consider the other two if you prefer a fuller sound down low and a softer top end. But if you like a more neutral or transparent sound, or, and this is very important, you already own a third-party DAC that you love, get the Wim Pro. Now, Eversolo's DMP A6 is, in my opinion, the most like the Cambridge, except the A6 has more options than a Porsche 911, at least compared to the 100. The A6 is more transparent, detailed, spacious, with better separation throughout the soundstage than the Wim, or the Cambridge. If you're chasing a sensation of warmth either through, say, an injection of bass or rolled off treble or both, the A6 has one of the best PEQ solutions I have ever seen, which will let you tailor the sound to your liking. I'm team ever solo in this head-to-head. -head. 
If you already own other Cambridge products and like their sound and are just looking for a competent streamer in the Cambridge family, I would look at the more affordable Cambridge AXN 10. The 10 is essentially the same streamer, just without the 100's built-in DAC or color screen. And if those features don't matter to you or are redundant elsewhere in your system, you're going to find no major difference in the user experience between the 10 and the 100. So in this case, I get the AXN 10. It's a great product that's going to save you half the money. So what about upgrading from the CXN V2? Look, if you want to experiment with a new DAC, knock yourself out. But I can't tell you that there's going to be a night and day difference. If you want a true step up from either the V2 or the 100, be prepared to dig real deep into those pockets because the Edge NQ is the next stop. So what else is there? Well, you could go with the Blue Sound Node, or better yet, the Power Node, which has a built-in amp, and both are gonna run you less while giving you more. Way different sound, of course, but still very comparable. Speaking of an all-in-one solution, the Yamaha 1000A does even more than all of the comparisons we've just mentioned. Yes, you're gonna spend about 600 bucks more than the Cambridge, but for your money, you're getting a 100 watt per channel stereo amp, analog inputs, which include a phono preamp, and a built-in DAC streamer, with HDMI and, and, and. When directly comparing the sound of the CXN100 with its internal DACs to that of the Yamaha, there is a difference tonally, but I wouldn't say that difference is night and day. I like both products sound equally. It really does depend on what I'm listening to as to which one is gonna get the win. One thing is for certain, the Yamaha is just as easy to use but way more flexible. I know it's easy to watch a review like this and think that I really don't like the CXN100, but that's not true. We have to stop looking at critical reviews in a negative light. Otherwise, we're all just choosing to live inside an echo chamber, in which case you don't need a review. You just need Cambridge's press release. Because looking at the 100 on its own, and I'm talking as a DAC streamer, I think Cambridge has built a really good product. Like their DAC Magic products, the 100 ranks among my favorites when listening pleasure is all that I consider. And if I just focus on that, I actually love this thing. But if you're feeling a little confused at this point, join the club because it's 2024 and for 1100 bucks, I guess I just expected more. All right, guys, that's it. That's our review of Cambridge's brand spanking new CXN100 DAC streamer, DAC streamer preamp, whatever it is. What do you guys think? Let us know down in the comments below. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Hell, share it with everyone you know. Uh, <laughs> and be sure to ring the bell too so that you're notified when new videos come out. If you use any of the links that Christy's left for you down below, know that it's a great way that you continue to show your support for this channel and the work that we do here. And both of us, thank you very, very much for doing that. Uh, follow me on Instagram at Recovering Audiophile, and that's it. That's it for us today. So remember, the only person who has to like the sound of your system is you. So happy listening, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. Bye.